Hi, I'm Emily Jacoby from Digital Democracy. We're a New York-based nonprofit, but we work globally and we focus on helping marginalized communities really harness new technologies and to um, amplify their voices. So I'm here today because some of our colleagues in the Southeast Asian country of Burma, Myanmar, are doing some really incredible work, but also because I must say, we really enjoy a challenge, and working in this context is indeed very difficult, um, particularly mapping the ongoing low-level crisis of human rights abuses in the country. So this is a map of uh, Burma. You can see it's situated right in between South and Southeast Asia, surrounded by giants, Bangladesh, India, China, Thailand, um, the country was actually the most, um, the most developed country uh, at the time of um, independence in 1948 in Southeast Asia, but since then it's fallen to be the lowest. Um, this is an image from downtown Yangon. There's some major challenges we're facing. First of all, there's overt oppression. Military dictatorship has ruled the country since 1962. They um, don't allow freedom of speech. They crack down violently against peaceful protesters. There's over 2,000 political prisoners. The country was renamed Myanmar by the military government in 1989, but it's not only the country name. Um, down to the, the cities, down to the village level have all been renamed, which means that the most accurate maps of the country, which come from World War II era, no longer translate, and that's a real challenge. Um, another major challenge is the fact that the government, when oppression and obfuscation don't work, they'll actually pull the plug, and in 2007, they turned off the internet and mobile phone for five full days. So in the face of such enormous challenges, which I've only listed a few, um, we've been working with local partners to develop kind of a variety of tools and tactics to address the, the problems. And it's been really inspiring to see the way that they've combined, first of all, the need for both high-tech options around mobile phones, um, internet, et cetera, but then also with low-tech, um, you know, using, using newspapers to share information, using radios, using pen and paper to document information. The most important thing we do is really focus on security, um, ways that people can circumvent uh, the censors inside the country, and then also really just basic digital literacy. This is a picture of my friend Upin Yazata, who was one of the monks in 2007, demonstrating how he would hide a flip camera under his robe to take pictures and uh, to take footage. This is a picture from Bar Camp Yangon. Uh, it was held in January, and it was an amazing opportunity for 3,000 technologists, journalists, activists, et cetera, to come together to talk about and build solutions together. So. We're working on a program called Handheld Human Rights. We're actually not building any sort of tools. We're just working to get the right tools that already exist in the hands of people who desperately need them, working with technology groups as well as a um, consortium of human rights organizations. The first aspect of Handheld Human Rights is using open source tools um, for, for really helping secure communication amongst these, um, these groups. And so we're using Frontline SMS, we're using GeoChat, um, and then an Android um, Guardian project. We also do a lot of around secure documentation. MARTIS is an open source database um, for encrypted information that already exists that people have been document putting in human rights information for years, and we've been pulling from that. And then we've been using digital pins and experimenting with how digital pins can help help uh, human rights workers who go into the country and often will come back with reams of information, take notes on paper, um, even onto um, forms, and then be able to destroy the paper as they, after they do their interviews. And then the third aspect has been sharing that information and aggregating. Um, we've currently aggregated about the past 12 years of human rights information and reports that exist. So using the Ushahidi system has been really a huge benefit to us because it allows for translation into local languages, because it allows for, um, actually we're using it more within a closed network, but it allows for the closed network to all update that information and to harness volunteers to find that. And then also the, for analysis, looking at what parts of the map do we have good information? What aspects, what particular human rights abuses do we not have enough information on? Do we need to do more research? And it's helping the human rights workers determine, okay, what are our priorities for our documentation for next year and the year after that? We've added an election layer, which is only gonna become more relevant over the next month. Elections are coming up at the end of November. And um, 
we're very excited for how this is going to be visualized in the, um, in the campaigns. And then I really want to end what has been a very short overview by saying these are some of the solutions we've come up with. We know there's many more. We really benefit from getting to know you and the tools you work on, harnessing them and taking them to people on the ground who can actually use them. So find me later, and in exchange for giving us good ideas, I can tell you all about your Burmese horoscope. Thank you.